Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hello. Hello, Medina. How are you doing? Can you hear me, Rabia? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hold on a second. Oh, oh and I've got you. I've got you. Okay, there great. Oh, sorry about Wonderful. that. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm very tired. We just had to go to Granada for something and got back about half an hour ago. So I'm a little bit like, Whoa. No, dear. <laughs> but actually fine. I'm just fine. I'm just moaning. <laughs> <laughs> good. How about you? Yeah, good. Alhamdulillah, everything's good. Welcome everyone to this event. I think it's going to be a lovely event. And I'm going to start by reading the introduction that Abdulhai Moor gave, which I think is a very good introduction. Um, let's see. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to the poetry imbibing world the first collection of English American poet Medina Whiteman, who, as she lives in a mountain town in Spain with her calligrapher husband, raising her three children and a Sufi Muslim, might be called an expat Spanish as poet as well. But with her life of travel and study, as well as her skill and maturity, she is also a world poet. You can safely and delightedly come to these poems for spiritual refreshment. She having situated her vivid and exact memory behind our own eyes, so that we recognize our own experiences in her sometimes deceptively breezy accounts. She's a poet who, when she puts her mind to it and in the grip of an inspiration, thinks in poetry. She'll no doubt write her deathbed poem on her deathbed. After all, only three hours after writing 10 days late, she gave birth, just shy of writing a poem during. <laughs> and in a holy secret shared, barely escaped with her life, writing a terrific poem soon after. There's also an echoing Orden-esque tone here in her ease of diction, precision of observation and surprise epiphanies. In its pitch perfect conversational tone lies a healing illumined by her love of Allah and his prophet, peace be upon him, and based in the daily and keenly observed, and it shines, but she gives it all a light touch by not, talk, by not taking herself too seriously, while her heart inventories more touchy and touching subjects, motherhood, womanhood, prayer and hypocrisy, in a fine cardiac tuning of mind and eye, poetry's true dimension. Here are poems that include her wishing to go against type and her whiteness even, with her name itself proclaiming its bogus prerogative, now wishing she were black, as she says, to blend in with the earth's majority rainbow of dark skin tones. I even went to Kenya, Tanzania, Zanzibar, learned Kiswahili well enough to fool a local if he did not see my face. But still one night aboard a boat, an old man greeted me with Shikamu, I touch your feet. Or a, a visionary take on the soul's calligraphy. I've seen the script of an unseen soul deciphered letters as they danced Quran through ink black, black ocean storms, pulled scything oars of Ra's and Zars to veil the bone white nakedness of paper and breathe its dead wood to life. Or an almost epic high velocity spirit of enlightened near mythic woman in the whirler. We sit on the hem of her skirt as it rises and falls and watch as the cycles of heartbreak and hope follow on while the whole crazy circus spins on these sure feet that never once lose their rhythm. Medina is also a remarkable prose writer and it seems in her young life she's already been all over the world and rarely the beaten path. So many of her poems have a short story-like feel such as The Loneliest Tea Room in India that inserts us into this experience as she does so well and so often with her sharp photographic precision. We left at nightfall, Delhi still ringing in my ears, the menacing rickshaw driver, the protective tuk-tuk driver, and now this bus, a pencil case on wheels, conducted by a man with lip stains red with betel nut. Then, then there's the traumatic finale with a divine twist in the penultimate poem, a holy secret shared that brings together Medina's bright reportage, her themes of motherhood, creative protector and nurturer, and writings out of a real experience and write and sorry, and rings out of, of real experience, a poem of profound resonance, 
whose ending with its subtle evocation <clears throat> of the majesty of God leaves us breathless. With Medina Whiteman's lively metamorphizing voice, we have here finely detailed poetic stances on whatever attracts her and her pen, and her heart is here, and its century petal ripples edge out to our own world and wash over it as if with our own sensibilities, and it is a welcoming thing, a sweet and healing thing to know these enlightened trails. And that is by Daniel Abdul Hai Moore, um, who died in 2016. Oh, it's very strange to hear that again. I hadn't even read that <laughs> really? in, um, well, since the book actually came out, which was in 2019. Yeah. Is it 2019? No, no, it came out before 2019. It came out in 2015. Because that was the year my son was born. Or maybe it was 26. I can't even remember now. It's all a blur. But anyway, that's it's really quite strange to hear that back again. Yeah. <laughs> So um, do you want to start by just reading or should we yeah, talk about, a bit about what sort of how you started uh, writing poetry first? Yeah, that, that would probably be a nice little preface. Um, yeah. So the, this book kind of came out of about probably 10, 10 years of, of poems that I've been sort of um, slowly collecting and, you know, putting them into a a document and then occasionally kind of going I don't like those check them out um eventually sort of sitting with a, a number of them and thinking well nobody else is going to want these this was before Lotri Press came along so um I thought well I'll, I'll self-publish it and um I approached Daniel Abdul Moore, who was my mentor for a period of time um with to specifically to do with poetry and writing also he'd edited a short story and published a short story of mine with um islamica magazine who was editing that as well and he said oh i want to publish it because it you know he he mostly was self-publishing his own collections but he also liked to to sometimes publish other people's work and um there's only th this was just one of two books that he'd published by um by different poets other than himself and and actually, as it happened, he was um, very ill with cancer at the time. And um, a month later, he passed away. Mashallah, um, Rahim Allah. It's, it's it's really extraordinary. It's really moving to hear the words that he was writing about that time. You know, himself being in that state of like approaching death and and still taking the time to do that for another person, which is a huge gift. Mm -hmm. um, and he'd, he'd sort of given me some feedback as well on some of those poems. I mean, often, for example, the, the, I mean, I was quite influenced, I think, particularly these poems were quite influenced by his style of wrote, writing, which is sort of almost like a bit breathless. Like it's sort of like lots of enjambment, you know, just like one long sentence that just runs on and on and on over many, many, many lines. And some of his poems are really epic. Like he's written kind of book length poems. Um, and some, but sometimes he would say, you know, try just taking up the last two lines. You know, sometimes I would yeah. find myself overwriting a little bit. So mm -hmm. he, and also just, just having that encouragement as well. Like he was a very encouraging writer. Um, he really wanted Muslims to just be creative, like kind of step out of whatever, you know, box we sometimes put ourselves into um, yeah. for, various, for lots of different reasons. And um, so I always really appreciated that. And we kind of connected on this like quite zany level as well, because <laughs> he, was very, he was a very funny person. He was yeah. quite quite hilarious um and had this very sort of oddball way of looking at the world and he would just write about it, literally everything and so I was very kind of um uh yeah encouraged to do the same thing I suppose and just be daring just like mm. you know, write a poem about a beetle write a poem about a beetle like who cares you know there's no limits actually to what you can write poems about yeah. um so that was uh you know I think his influence really helped me to break out of you know I think I wrote a lot as a kid I absolutely loved writing stories I really just thought I'm going to write novels because I just fell in love with novels at a young age and thought right this is what I want to do for my life I am actually writing a novel which Robbie knows about but it's plainly you know, about more than 20 years into writing it so <laughs> don't hold your breath um but I really loved writing stories when I was young I loved fantasy and I loved like anything that was just really exciting and just kind of swept you away and then I think Somewhere in high school, even though I went to a high school that was, you know, it had 
co comparatively, it had a lot of um, emphasis on the creative arts. There were pretty good art teachers and writing, you know, literature teachers and um, theater. We had a really good theater department. And I did a lot of theater. I did some Shakespeare. I was a uh, Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, okay. I was actually at that play. <laughs> you were? Were you in it? You in no, it? I watched you. I came. You me. Yeah, Medina and I have known each other since we were little. So, so our parents time. became Muslim in the 70s. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was actually there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, because you were living in the same town for a few years. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, I've, the, the video of that has long gone. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not worried about that ending up on YouTube. But that was quite fun. And um, and musical, uh, I yeah, did some musicals and things like that. And then I got really into music. And so I kind of started focusing a lot more on songwriting. Mm. I think writing songs without me realizing prepared me in some ways for writing poems because a poem, a song is a poem, really. It's just one that's being sung. Obviously, with a the poem, there's more to it as well. What I realize now is that poetry also has a theatrical element to it, especially, you know, spoken word poetry. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a performing um, aspect to it. And so, again, I was sort of coming at it from all these different angles. Um, performing in general, I'm like, I'm quite um, comfortable performing, which is, I guess, quite unusual. I mean, a lot of people struggle with going up, up on a stage and yeah, to kind of relish it in a way, which obviously... <laughs> Makes me sound like very big headed, um, which is also <laughs> probably not untrue either. But um, but I think also going on a stage, not that I've been on very big stages before in my life, I've got to say, but to be on a stage or to be, you know, presenting, performing, mm -hmm. or presenting, uh, giving a talk, giving a conference, it forces you to really be present. And I think for people who are, you know, very scattered or maybe struggle with being present, being on a stage actually really helps with that mm. and I've heard that from other people as well musicians and singers and so on um so yeah so then this book I guess when I I sent this um this manuscript to Abdul Hai and I said would you write an introduction to it and he said no I want to publish it so he went and I went ahead and published it and um yeah I, I do think that was still one of the most generous things anyone ever did for me like mm. while you know, having terminal cancer. So mm, wow. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it is, it is, we also, Robbie and I um, have known each other doing poetry online for since, since way back because of the Facebook group that, that started out, that Lotri kind of grew out of, which was yeah. founded by, by Rabia and I was. Yeah, uh, that was about 15 years ago, I think. Gosh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. It is crazy to think about that. Um, Yeah. And I just think, there hasn't really been much of a space for the kind of writing that I wanted to do. I mean, the sort of mm. poetry I wanted to do was, it's funny that now I'd completely forgotten that after I mentioned this um, Audin, because it's, yeah, like the kind of a conversational tone. That's something I do also. I, I write also nonfiction and I love writing um, kind of uh, creative nonfiction or literary nonfiction. Um, I think it's it's really good to blend genres and, you know, not feel limited because it might be that I, you know, I did a, a, an art show last year with my poems that were um, illuminated. I can show you actually, I just got some prints made. Um, there's a series about plants, about certain trees that grow locally. And uh, so I wrote some poems and they were illustrated by Medina Trevathan, who some of you might know, she's a uh, quite well-known piano artist. Oh, except the blur is going to stop mm, it. It's not working, working too well. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah, so basically we were kind of like inspired by Andalusian manuscripts, uh, botanical manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a shame you can't really see properly, but so the poem was sort of written onto the the paper, which was actually hemp paper from India. And uh, oh. in and and Andalus, they did used to use hemp paper, so it was quite, mm. it was quite authentic. And yeah, she she sort of did these stylized images of the of the plants that the poem is related to. So I mean, my point is just that I think a book is a, a really wonderful thing. It's, it feels like an accomplishment, but I think also poetry can live in all these different um, mediums and mm -hmm. and formats. And it might be that it turns into a song, and it might be that you read a poem. I just on Thursday I did a concert. <laughs> Randomly, I've somehow become a Kawali singer. I, I don't actually claim to be a Kawali singer, but somehow the, the musicians in the place where I live, we, we play, we sing a lot of like devotional songs. 
and suddenly Qawwali has become really popular and people are like, sing Qawwali, come on, do Allahu. So yeah, anyway, I've just started. Not not as a main singer, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, for everybody else, because I don't think I pull that, pull that one off. But we had a song where there was like a, a space in the song for some kind of other participation. And I read a poem, which I, I'll read in a minute. Um, and it's just, you know, you can read a poem over instrumentation or over percussion. Um, there's so much that you can do with a poem. And it's kind of what, in the end, I sort of realized that poetry, poetry is this really multifaceted thing. You know, you can write a poem that feels like a holograph, like you're stepping inside and walking around and seeing all the details. It's like a shaft of light that's kind of gone into someone's life mm -hmm. and they've detailed it and impressed it into the into the page for you to kind of come back and and um to be able to experience it like vicariously um which is quite a it's almost a sort of miraculous thing really but it can also function all these other ways as well it can be it can turn into a folk song that you know unites people and people sing as a choir and it becomes an intergenerational you know repository of knowledge or or, or culture um I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> it would it would be lovely to think that you know one day one of us could make a song that would turn into a a folk song or you know why not <laughs> I love folk music as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the story behind this behind this book. Um, and I also got my husband again. I don't think the blur might not. Let no, that, me. that's working. That looks nice. I have to trick Zoom to make them think that this is my face. <laughs> Look, calligraphy that um, my husband did. I keep telling him. Please do more calligraphy. Oh, his he does really beautiful calligraphy, mashallah. Very, very lovely. Um, Nastalik, Iranian style. And this is a, a saying attributed to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. You think you are nothing but a speck, yet the vast cosmos is unfurled in you. O mankind, you are a clear book by whose letters the invisible become becomes visible. So yeah, I'll um, read some poems. And if anybody has any questions or some thoughts, just just put them in the chat and I can um, respond as and when. Where is the chat? Why can't I find the chat? Oh, oh just I've done something weird to it. <laughs> over there. And also like, just say hi, say where you're joining us from. I think probably we'll do that at the end. Okay. Um, just because I think it it will make it it's better time. to keep it sort of separate, I think. I'm recognizing names though. Irvina, I've been in touch with you through Instagram. Hi. Asifa, I think I know as well. I'm really quick, really sorry. I'm getting oh and Sakina. Oh my gosh. And oh my gosh. I know all you guys. Oh, this is so lovely. Okay. I really want to see your faces later though. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this one, which I found I found really funny. This was after an Eid in Orgiva, the town where I live. And um, it's kind of a hippie town. There's a lot of, there's a, quite a big Sufi community here, various different Kalikas. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's countryside. So every the kids get muddy and it's, it's fun. <laughs> so this one is called Firstborn. This was about, this was one of the first ones, the earlier poems that I wrote that went into this book. So Firstborn. Inched off the mud soaked cords, you fell asleep in hours ago. Food drunk at the end of the Eid party. Face crusted with lamb biryani and illicit jammy cakes. Alien earth now smudging my pink striped sheets. More washing. You stir and whimper. Clutch my face to your sticky one-year-old cheek. Willing my weight to drag you under again. But sleep is reluctant. A closed-eyed smile contorts the fat cheek, squashed by my encroaching kiss. You laugh in an ecstasy of touch. My every atom laughs in synchrony. A joy that would keep millions of crackheads high for over a year, if only they could damn well synthesize it. Ha! It's all for me, me and the jam on the pillowcase. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes find I think I must look really mad when I'm writing because I do sometimes just crack up as I'm writing <laughs> that is a really lovely one I have to say some of my favorite poems of yours are the ones about motherhood 
Mm. Well, while I was also writing these poems, I was writing a blog called Cave Mom, which I've since um, kind of archived because I guess I started a new blog on Substack and I... Have, yeah, have I still got those posts though, because some of them are really, really still good. Got them. One of them I actually re kind of worked on and I did a few uh, different um, edition like versions of it. And it's just been um, anthologized. It's just come out in a book called, okay. I don't have it to hand, but I can bring it out in a second or a little bit later. It's called The Ordinary Chaos of Being Human. And and that um, that essay went onto my blog as, is she dreaming or is she dying? And then in the, the final version of it in the book, it's called Doing the Wool. Because it's about uh, an episode where I was looking after some sheep. I, don't I, remember, know, I don't remember that actually. I did read episodes. Um, was I was looking after some sheep, and it was uh, sadly they hadn't been sheared for several years, and we just kind of been lumbered with this flock of sheep to look after, and we didn't really know what we were doing. And it got really, really, really hot, and they started dying of of heat stroke. So, mm. um, but it's also meditation on wool because like wool, sulf that's all wolf like what's the connection there is there a connection mm. anyway but so yeah the blog um I think the blog and the poems I was kind of writing uh, a lot sort of contemporaneously and at the time this was really before my third kid came along and so I had a like the very first blog post I wrote was um dinner at the cave a recipe for disaster and it was when I was pregnant with my second child so that was like from 2009 through to about I don't know when I stopped writing it I'm um, probably like 2020 or something like that mm -hmm. so it, was about, it was about it was definitely about 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and that was really when like motherhood was just like the main thing that was happening in my life it was 24 7 it was absolutely relentless and non-stop yeah um, and then they start to get a bit older and now my kids are about to be 16 about to be 14 and my youngest is nine just turned nine so it's kind of a different scene and mm, yeah you know, I often I often think actually that like around the age I'm at I'm like nearly 42 now I kind of think well you sort of need to have jobs that you really enjoy and give you a lot of personal reward because like parenting teenagers can really be quite <laughs> grim <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> need to find joy in other places like <laughs> like that poem I just read you can find so much joy in a tiny child yeah start, start to get you can still get a lot of joy with the older kids as well um yeah I, I want to read one now called mirrors have moved up in the world it's funny I really haven't even read a lot of these poems before mm -hmm. oh. once I don't know when mirrors were still pools of water and the faces in them, downcast, eyes glowing, bathed in reflected light. When we first learned how we looked, it was as thinkers, mourners, cradlers of sleepy children. In this humble curve, we discovered our surprised selves, in unexpected ponds, saw there our souls undressed. Now mirrors have moved up in the world, we peer in, eye to eye, shoulders back, jaws set. A photo booth's rectangular frame. We preen our feathers and imagine how the world must meet us. This reflection's hard as diamond. No curious fingertip can turn the surface to circles or drop in a shell to listen for its depth. The image returns impassively and we can't wash our hands in it or take a piece in palm to scrutinize and scatter. Some empowerment programs elevated mirrors to wall status. Now they're immune to dirty feet, to fishing nets and worn out rags. Whatever tears, sorry, whatever tears or snarls they witness, there is no change in temperature. Folds of shawls no longer hang towards, reaching as though in yearning but drop down shamefully. If we bow our heads, we lose sight of this vision. In silver, mirrors have at last become our equals. Honestly, I can't remember where that one came from. It just... Uh... 
it's just the experience of being in this post postmodern world where you know we don't have those um simple lifestyles anymore not to romanticize them too much either because they're also very hard but the way that we relate to ourselves and i mean looking at this was before i was using instagram this was before i knew what zoom was maybe before zoom existed so the way that we experience ourselves through a square and through a camera and through our imaginations of how somebody else must see us is i think it's had a tremendous impact in our psychology and also in our spiritual states because i think a lot of people suffer from some kind of feeling of not knowing who they are and some kind of emptiness oh so on that topic i'll read another one called one drop which is a bit more cheerful although poetry doesn't have to be cheerful this is also something i've had to learn you know uh i think i'm a kind of a recover a recovering people pleaser and sometimes there's an urge in a poem. I often go to poetry when I just feel like I'm in a real funk and I feel really rubbish. I feel really weird and confused and like, eh. And this is like the way out of it. It's a door to get out. And it just sort of, like some people go for a walk or go for a run or, you know, do some gardening. I find writing poetry really, really helps with that. Um, but it's also nice to not do it only for that reason. It's also good to like, write a poem when you feel really good. That's a nice uh, exercise as well not just when you feel bad. This one is called One Drop. Whenever rocks fall in, resounding in this cavity, a tide rises up unexpected, pouring out in all directions, warm, effacing. Allah says with the tongue of his servant in prayer, Sami Allahum and Hamidam. So said the one accustomed to this waterfall, it is, not, it is not us saying it, not our tongue at all, but his finding in us a mirror to gaze into, a pupil to gaze out through in wonder, legs with which to wander the jungle of brick and bamboo. He's brought you out of the void to entertain you with. He's brought out of the void to entertain you with. When the tide ebbs, this jungle oversteps its boundaries. Our new hollowness, hollowness resounding with an ache that is forgotten while the play is projected on its walls. Canned laughter does a good impression of joy, but nothing else can go this deep and fill it up to overflowing. Once you know the infinity you have within, no flickering lights can flood you to the brim, like witnessing his presence turning the prison of your chest into the everything you scrabble for with hands that could not hold more than one drop of this fathomless swell. Go that deep, stand the damp and cold, and see how empty all those entertainments left you. And one sob, one drop that falls into this void, calls up the breakers, and you'll weep for all the vacuums you have ever been, and for how quickly he rushes in to fill them. Wonderful, Mashallah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one that I really like, I, I don't know if you've got other ones that you wanted to Oh, read. I can just keep going, you know, ad hoc. Okay. Um, yeah. I really like the one called Two States. Oh, yeah. Um, because it just, for me, it really reflects what motherhood is like, you know, and the sort of paradoxical fact that, um, like, things not being perfect and being messy can actually be a source of sort of creativity. So I, re I really did like that. <laughs> and in particular... Yeah. We've been in the trenches together, Rabia. And I know we have. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids are similar it's ages. And... <laughs> so many times we'd go down to the river or just go for a walk somewhere. It'd be like, just just take them off the leash and let them run. Let them like... <laughs> Burn off some energy. Alhamdulillah, it's been, it's been an absolute honor and it's an incredible thing to... No, it is. Children. It, it is, it would... 
of course be so much better if if mothers were supported more <laughs> yeah okay this one is called two states thank you Irvina I've been learning some uh, um, Albanian actually but I'll tell you later okay two states compete for my longing one a room for living in with wood fire burning behind smudged glass a heap of books some open wet socks hung on the back of a chair a bowl of fruit some cut and not yet brown shoes towed off and left at irreverent angles something humming in a corner processing dried fruit or data and even when the room is empty of people it is thrumming with the echo of them the other is wall-to-wall -wall cabinets neatly closed dust free windows freshly windexed a bank of new steel imax working glitchlessly leather seats arranged to look casual there were no crescents of coffee on the coffee table or crumbs on the geometric rug no piles of dry clothes to fold or smeary glasses waiting to be washed a fog of central heating closes throats to a polite silence no ash Double glazing drowns out the noise of the neighbor's dog. Here one can concentrate. There are no cobwebs to sigh over or interruptions by small children thumping each other over felt tip pens. Behind the cabinet doors are stationary supplies to last till kingdom come. Fresh orders of necessities have been made weeks in advance, for there is no chaos here to hinder business. No boring list of frets to get on top of before projects can fructify. This orchard yields polished apples, red and round, without pockmark or warp, grown under supervision, under daylight lamps to industry standards. The latter is where half a million is small change, where minds boil and brew great schemes, reach nebula heights, Dynamic people drop in to ping ideas about and everything occurs on time. The former, though, is the only place my mind will sink its toes into soft soil, send down tap roots that drink from hidden aquifers, and while my hands are paring socks, cutting paper snowflakes, making tea stains on the table, the real business is happening on another schedule one that sees a calendar like any other piece of earth to be and makes misshapen fruits that fall and lie embedded in nettles as edible ore in the ground of home. The only guarantee this place gives me is that nothing will be perfect. At least I can't be disappointed. Here the products hug me back, leave me love, love notes in scrambled English. The day they leave and my rug goes for weeks, without a hint of a crumb, I might finally get something done if I can only stop myself from spending all day blinking in surprise at the quiet and missing the mess. Yeah, that's definitely the <laughs> the mother writer poem. <laughs> that's yeah, about it really captures it for me. Wanting so much to just be in the thick of it and just be blown away, you know, in the flow <laughs> whatever's going on let's just get all the paints out and let's just go crazy and make a theater and yeah and you know you have the the adulting that also has to happen you know, yeah no, I guess you need, you need both I suppose to be able to um to be able to enjoy one to be able to appreciate both of them mm. ah yeah I'll just keep reading whatever I see coming up another one I really like is um which actually really because I think you do actually forget what it's like to be a child mm. um and the one called a game was not just a game that one really sort of brought it it actually made me think okay that's what my kids are going through <laughs> yeah. you no know, it really sort of brings it home um you kind of do I think you do forget we do completely forget. And I think that's the great thing about imagination is that it enables us to to get back into it. And also, I just want to make a little side note is that 
even though I'd had all these great plans for writing all these books and stuff. And, you know, before I had children, I had all the time in the world to do it and I didn't do it. Mm. But it was only after I had kids that I was able to somehow, in the midst of all this, carve out the time to make books happen, which is quite surprising. It seems counterintuitive, but mm. I think the reason for that is I really wanted it more. I, wa- I became really desperate to write. And so I kind of forced myself. I made the time and I would stay mm. up late. Have you you become more focused in the time you have, probably. Exactly. But I think also it was a support that I had. I had Abu Hai. I come from a very creative family as well. And so like my mum has always been she's been a great inspiration for me with books she's always sort of passed really good books to me so she kept me reading yeah again motherhood kids kids are small my reading just completely dropped off I just stopped reading almost entirely unless I was ill and then it was like a healing because I would just be sitting down Mm. with a hot water bottle and a cup of tea and I'd read an entire book in one sitting and get up feeling better Uh, so uh, yeah I do think writing whether it's stories or poems can definitely be healing to do the writing itself it could be a great healing and also Mm -hmm. when it's done with that um attitude to read it I think can be very healing as well yeah it depends what the illness is but um so this is called a game was not just a game things used to be so important a game was never just a game It was a landmine running dare across the football pitch, a death or ecstasy event of hula hoops and fences scaled, apples scrumped, neighbours evaded, metal put to trial, burned till it smelts and smokes away the impurity of youth. We weren't playing. Baffling fragments of the grown-up universe were being unencrypted by chalk-fingered quantum physicists in Alice bands germinating theories to explain the adult mystery in Skipping Song. An evening in with bath bubbles or learning a new word, drawing horses better than ever before, while the sunshine on the rope swing slid coolly to the grass, meant perfect harmony, harm within these walls impossible. Loyalty did not mean supermarket cards, but pinpricked fingers Beatings taken out of solidarity. Troth pledged until death, or at least next summer, when everything would have changed and so would we. A fickle insult would, for one volcanic moment, dismantle all that was familiar and good. The edifice of our own worth reduced to wiry rubble. All hope melted, sucked away before we had the chance to wallop them back. Every birthday scratched a tally mark, a tattoo of distinction from the embarrassment of being small on pinch rouged faces. One milestone closer to the distant golden land of the incomprehensibly big, not knowing when we emerged there, just how dusty and distracted we would be and longing for another go on the rope swing. Wonderful, I love that one. Thank you. I would just love to read, this is a short one. It's actually the, the oldest one in the whole book. And this was, I wrote this just after having my first child as well. I know this is a little bit, I'm going on and on about motherhood here. I'll read some mothers that are not so related to it, but this is the oldest one that went in. Uh, it's called The Vacuum. <clears throat> the door swings open, pivots lazily like a child hanging from a door handle, thinking holiday thoughts. Your breathing shudders, some unknown fear ebbing to amnesia in your sleep. I must get up, get something done. I peel you off as slow as branches grow, breaking the vacuum that loving you creates. Lever you back against a cushion where you splay out, mouth an open dot, a stripe across your cheek from the seam of my shirts, the outline of your ear imprinted on my chest. Oh, I'm going to start crying. (laughs) That's lovely. Yeah, gosh. Um, I was wondering if you could read Physical Vicar. Mm, I just went over that, actually. Here it is. Yeah, this is also one of the really early ones. I don't often do 
rhyming poems and I'm sort of trying to um, come back to it a little bit. I actually wrote a sonnet recently. It was the first time I managed to write a sonnet, um, I guess, because I, I do, I suppose I do have this very sort of rattling along kind of voice and it's quite hard to pin it down and sort of stuff it into these like envelopes you know of verses and whatnot so this yeah, one is I um uh, when I was younger I used to try to rhyme things we were actually in a band Robbie well, and yeah I. we were we were a band oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> I still remember your songs yeah great <laughs> anyway <laughs> I I went into a free verse stage when I never rhymed anything and actually just recently in we've got this um poetry membership Lotri Press and we've been looking at traditional forms of poetry in the Muslim world. And the Qasida form and the Ghazal both, you know, have this rhyme at the end, which goes all the way through. Um, and the Ghazal in particular is amazing because it has a sort of pattern of rhyme that goes all the way through. Um, yeah. And so just recently that there's actually, we were reading from a book by Abdul Hai where he, he wrote 99 ghazals in English, which was amazing. Um, and I did write a ghazal recently, which rhymed, Ooh. and I was quite pleased with it. <laughs> so much fun. I I found that was probably my way back into rhyming verse because mm. I found it really enjoyable to write. Um, oh, yeah. See, Asifa, Assalamu alaikum. Because in English, what I found people tend to do is they'll just use the same word at the end of the, the stanza and then rhyme the penultimate word which is gives it this extra kind of like ooh, it just feels really nice there's something really nice about that mm -hmm. I actually wrote uh, um, I think one of the only poems I've ever been commissioned to write possibly the only one was a, a ghazal I wrote a ghazal for Mokhtar and Soraya Sanders for their wedding mm -hmm. anniversary nice. Abdul Hai had written a ghazal for their wedding Oh, that's I was sweet. like, okay, well, that's it. I just have to do a ghazal. And it was, yeah. it was really fun, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really enjoy writing ghazals. Okay, so this one's called Physical Vicar. It passed through in the milk, crossed placenta's lifeblood bridge, entered muscles, bones, capillaries, a synaptic code message. Heard it sung as I was rocked in an ocean that does not drown kept in perfect floating stasis, unbiased by up or down. Learned the meaning of protection there, of never feeling fear. An anti-gravity encasement warmed by nearness of the near. Had it rhythmically taught to me in Mother Hadra dance, listened quietly as she sang it in my waking sleeping trance. Now whatever questions pose themselves like mirror gawking girls, Reflecting endlessly upon their looks, their freckles and their curls. There is something in my cells I can't disdain or regret. There's remembrance in my body. I can't physically forget. Of course, I forget all the time. I can't mm -hmm. say that I'm in this constant state of vigor, but... Yeah, it's interesting that I do find with Islam, there is this very embodied nature to worship and to vicar. Mm. Yeah. No, that's true. It's something, it's not just an abstract thing. And that's one of the things I love about it that you find yeah. it's. Um... No, that's, I think as I've got older, I've really come to appreciate the wisdom of the prayer and Ramadan in particular. Mm. They are so physical and it does just break your routine and make you turn back to the spiritual. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if we, I, I'm terrible about actually doing all the prayers on time, but if I was to really decide right I'm just going to do that regardless like whatever's happening I'm in a meeting yeah. just matter <laughs> turn off my camera just go and pray come back yeah um you know how much more sort of detached from that sort of overwhelm I might be you know mm -hmm. this is very inspiring this conversation this is going to help me a lot <laughs> in my in my life <laughs> okay I'm going to write I'm going to say a funny one now mm -hmm. love tm we regret to inform the public that Love TM will no longer be available in easy to swallow capsules with our patented time release formula and strict dosage developed to prevent unhealthy dependencies. Too many distasteful side effects have unfortunately been reported, including dizziness, 
vertigo, loss of appetite, insomnia, rashes, bad teeth and constipation. Patients remarked that after a short course, they were unable to manufacture love for themselves, instead relying upon our drug, which though scientifically proven and awarded dozens of accolades, still left them feeling numb and warmthless only minutes after consumption. It is a lamentable state of affairs when a respected company such as ours must remove from the, mar from the market such a rewarding product, leaving former users to find real love in its notoriously haphazard natural environment. Sufferers may seek it out in fleeting conversations with sweet-eyed strangers, a highly perilous act, especially when they offer kindness, or with their families, always dysfunctional, their friends clearly self-interested, or simply the unending life flow which cannot be homogenized and therefore 100% trustworthy. We advise a steady course of wealth collection, building figures in your bank balance and personae in your head, a comfortable home and dependable career, and the accrual of esteem in other people's reverent eyes. And let us not forget that one's worth is built of countless tiny triumphs. One can rifle through like cash when the love TM thirst bites. This will give a steadier appearance of love in your lives without any of the inconveniences that actual love entails. It is not, under any circumstances, advisable to try giving your love away, especially to people who won't give any back. Remember, love is like a cake. It's all about how much you get to eat yourself. The one who baked it for you, kind as they might be, is nonetheless irrelevant. Please follow these instructions to the letter if you wish to survive the tremendous withdrawal effects of giving up your course of love, TM. There are as yet no studies into the possible dangers of this ordeal. It is a leap from the top of a misty cliff. Believing, dear clients, you'll turn to birds and fly away undaunted. We take no responsibility for your post-love TM fates, and we have the most excellent lawyers. That one also makes me laugh. Yeah, that's great. I love that one. Moving on. Um, have you got one? There's another yeah. one. Um, Oh yeah, what what are you saying? What would you like? Uh, on one feather. Oh yeah, that's a lovely one. About there. Now most of my conversation with my kids is around charges. <laughs> <laughs> they learned percentages really, really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on one feather. Sixty-three. It's page sixty-three. Books have become my butterflies, alive for just one day or less, before the surf of routine comes crashing down overhead. Raising my feet from ocean bed, helter-skeltering me along the pages, soaked and distant. Books have become a bus stop, scratched with teenage loves, willing the passers-by to want to flee their own lives for an hour, a day, a night journey to foreign towns, a round trip when the back page flips shut. Books have become my hoopos, hooting some way off, a flash of black and white, too fluttersome to stay when I approach. Gone, perhaps I'll catch a feather. And on one feather, I can fly, hit thermals so high just one line could make me a kite and glide over terrains no one will ever see but I. On just one letter I could ride to caverns, canyons, cascades, altitude lakes blue as eyes, dry red streaked rocks, corporeal dunes, spruce forests so dense, sounds fight to reach our ears. Clearings where stand in moonlight round houses of polished wood in which are found circles of lovers of the word. They must exist. And I am going by any vehicle necessary to find them. So interesting, isn't it? Because like 
that was me being very, you know, kind of really longing to have some kind of community around writing. And subhanAllah, that things end up evolving and things end up developing. And I'm I'm very grateful for how, I mean, it, it took COVID to kind of force the issue, I think. But, you know, now there's all these different ways that we can actually connect with each other around writing, which is amazing. Let me know how you guys are doing. You can pop something in the in the chat. Um, say hello. Yeah, I was just thinking, how can people? Do you want to read any other poems or? Yeah, there's one or two others that I could yeah. per, perhaps. Oh yeah, it's almost uh, it's almost time. I have got a couple of po a couple of copies of this book at the moment, but I probably will need them for this this weekend because I'm part of a retreat and they may. I, I think I'm going to have to earmark them for that retreat but I have got a new order in so if anybody wants one then let me know and you can have a, a nice little discount so how should people if people want to connect with you what would be the best way for that you can I either... can send a link in an in an email or something if that's easier yeah um there's basically I kind of just dump everything on my Instagram I know it's horrible I hate meta but um I have a lot of links in my uh, link in bio. So I've got a Gumroad, um, which is where it's how I kind of process payments for my book. But I actually have them printed in the UK and they're print on demand. So I can, if someone is in the UK and they want a copy, I can order one and just have it sent straight to them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll send my, my handle is this. And you can DM me through that. Oh, wait, I sent that to Irina by accident. So that's Medi Medina Tenor, is it? Let me just uh, get it at Medina Tenor. Yeah. And my email is the same, Medina Tenor at um, gmail.com. If anybody yeah. wants to reach okay. out, do that. Right. Um, so shall we just bring everyone in? Oh, no, you wanted to read another poem, did you? There's a couple of, yeah, well, there was one or two that I could do. Oh, yeah. I could just do one more, the piece it pivots on. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I read this as part of a, this Kavali song called Tujum, which is just this absolutely stunning song by Avi de Parveen. Um, I'm sure any Pakistanis who are here will know exactly the song I'm talking about. So we did the, this performance of, of Tujum and it's about dancing and kind of whirling and sort of transcending and rising up. Um, the lyrics are very beautiful, actually. And so I read it as, with that kind of tune in the background. It's called The Piece It Pivots On. I used to look for answers in the warp and weft around, wondered what this fabric would look like once every crease was iron smooth. The expanse of cloth was so endless it hurt my eyes to keep looking, and all directions pulled me till I'd spun a skein of doubts and arguments so thick their soft accretion left me suffocated. But every spool has a core, an empty space at its dead centre, where the dynamo that clothed it finds the piece it needs to pivot on. The point of light in this vast swathe that veils like night, and where the pinpricks in it where the infinite broke through the cloth so we could see. Instead of looking for my needs out on savannas of plain cloth, I looked into the emptiness within to catch a heart full of that light. And then the landscape fell quite smooth, caught diamonds as they thundered from the sky. Those are the grains that form as light contracts upon our atmosphere. The mirrored discs we sew upon our dress to make like we're that night. Here are our stars. To spin our skirts and get tangled again, instead of staying still and owning nothing. This is the night. We are its stars. Yeah, it's funny to think also about tradition, like, you know, I don't really have a sort of Islamic tradition that I come from. So just uh, what, yeah, what tradition am I? I guess when you write, somebody once said to me, anytime you write, you are adding to the body of poetry that exists in the world. So you're doing something, you're making an act, like that's actually quite powerful. Um, and yeah, I guess things do evolve and you know also sonnets I learned quite recently were derived from the Mawasha from Al-Andalus so oh. this has been happening for a very long time already you know like adopting and adapting and 
making things your own. And I think the free verse thing has definitely been, it's been a very powerful kind of mm, part of the Western poetic experience. Um, but as Muslims, it's very, just very interesting to see how we fit in the global and the, the wider poetic scene. And poetry has been such a powerful, it's been such an important mm, creative modality for Muslims since the very beginning. And, you know, there were poets at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they were poets. I just uh, was reading a book called A Treasury of Aisha, and uh, she describes her improvising poems while riding a camel in battle and telling them to her people on either side of her to, like, encourage <laughs> them. I mean, it was just, it was such a, a part, an everyday part of life, and it was such an important part of their, you know, uh, key sort of peak experiences as well so I think as long as we can keep that alive I think that's um that's the important thing thank you Samina thank you so much Rabia for inviting me oh thank you it's been really nice <laughs> great to have you here and to hear all of your to hear you reading your poems which is lovely Hard. well you can see where the, the theatrical thing comes into it right because like it, it is there's a kind of theater in it and there's a certain kind of poem that needs to be read really slowly every word has <laughs> you know and then there's others that it's kind of like more free-flowing and it's fun yes Shannon exactly um thank you that's that's kind of what made me want to write poems really was just the bringing the magic out of the ordinary life and you know if I can't go and have like yeah alhamdulillah I've had great amazing experiences and I've been able to travel and I've been very blessed in many ways but I think many of these poems came out of me feeling very frustrated and stuck and domestic yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but you know within that also there's that kind of forces you to it trains you to bring your attention down to very tiny details which is very poetic actually and it's a really important um part of poetic training I think is there, there are actually some wonderful ones in that um Hazal book by Daniel Abdohaimo there's one about a soap bubble oh yeah <laughs> it's um it's amazing it's an amazing poem and then there's another one about him peeling an apple core oh the apple core that and is one of my favorite poems these of kind of epiphanies you know it's really it's really amazing yeah I love that poem exactly for that reason because he turns it into I mean on, on top of that the skill of turning it into a ghazal I mean that's really cool mm. like to just be in that moment of doing something really mundane and then just being like it opens out and it becomes it's not just representative of something much bigger but it actually is part of something much bigger and like transcendent and and yet yeah. it's all physically located in this one little space and I think a lot of really great poets particularly like contemporary poets um that's what they do really well it's like they take the really big and they somehow condense it or connect it to something very small and tangible and that makes it feel very accessible because you really sense it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I could be doing that. I remember doing that myself. So it feels, you know, very present. <laughs> it's so good to bring the hearts together. In yeah, it is lovely to see everyone. I think did I think I gave you already a code, didn't I, to send out? I don't know. Yeah, if you I'll gave... send it out to everyone if you just. Is, is it ready to use now? Because you said something about a wait list or something. Yes, it is ready to use. But actually, yes, I think it is better that you just, if you want a copy of the book, just um, get in touch with me. And um, hopefully in like a week or two, I should have physical copies again so I can send them out. But yeah. Okay. Your name down. Names on the list. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Rabia. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, you too. <coughs> And thank you everyone for coming. It's been really, really lovely to lovely turn out together. Yeah. Also, if anyone is interested, we do have this poetry membership, um, which is it's five ninety nine a month, and uh, we have like a monthly open mic, which we actually have this Saturday. Lovely. And so, if anyone wants to connect a bit more, then uh, you can sign up for that as well. Awesome. <laughs> it's so brilliant what you're doing, Michelle, Rabia. Rabia, I have to say, guys, Rabia is the OG, right? There's nobody else that's been like organizing around Muslim poets <laughs> as long as Rabia has been doing. So this is the community to join. <laughs>
well <laughs> it's fun it's what I'm interested in I guess I think you're just drawn to particular things you know yeah and and it just it, it feels rewarding to do it so you just end up doing it one way or, an, one way or another take care everybody it's so okay. lovely